Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, I invite you to turn with me to the very first page, Genesis chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I want to welcome those of you in our other locations across Metro DC, as well as others who are not able to be with us in person today. It's good to be together around God's Word. And even as I say that, like together, I love what together looks like here. Like I was just in the lobby here at Tyson's, and uh, I mean, we have, we're together from countries like Iran and Afghanistan and India. Uh, a brother who's visiting from India today. We have a delegation here at Tyson's from the Bahamian consulate who is celebrating 50 years of independence. Like, who knew? Like, so I don't even know where you guys are in the room, but we're so glad you're here. Like, and that's just one location, a few conversations. So it is good to be together from the nations around the word of God. So... Let's dive in. Life is fragile. Millions of people felt that in a surprising way this last Monday night as they watched a football player, Damar Hamlin, collapse suddenly on TV and immediately word spread through social media and other outlets. And by now, many, if not most, of us have heard about how he was administered CPR on the field and taken to an area hospital where he's improving but still in serious condition as we and many people are praying for his healing. But in a moment like that on Monday night football, we suddenly remember what really matters. And it's not a game on a field or money people make. And it's not the million other things that capture all of our attention in this world. What matters is life. And life not just now, but life forever. Monday night was a reminder that none of us is guaranteed a next breath. Which means it's wise for all of us to step back and reset our lives around what really matters. So here at the start of this new year, I want to help you reset to remember what really matters about your life and others' lives and to resolve, if I could use that overused overused word, but I really want to challenge you to resolve to live for what really matters now and forever. So we've started a new year in our church's Bible reading plan, which I invite you all to be a part of. And don't worry if you're starting late, it's definitely not too late. But this Bible reading plan involves reading two chapters of the Bible each day. And over the course of two years, you'll read through the entire Old Testament once and the New Testament and Psalms twice. I always say I invite you to join us in reading the Bible, even if you're not a Christian. After all, this is the most famous book in the history of the world. Shouldn't you at least figure out why? And then there are others of you who are Christians, you're followers of Jesus, but you've never read the whole Bible. Certainly you don't want to stand before God one day and say, I was too busy to read your word. And for those who have read the whole Bible, I trust you know by now that there's so much more to be gained by meditating on God's word again and again and again. So we'll get to that in a minute. But the reason I mention this here at the start is because our Bible reading plan has begun in Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, and Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. And both of these books are so helpful for resetting our lives and remembering what matters. And what I want to do today is to highlight how these opening chapters in Genesis and Matthew reset our lives by refocusing us 
on the most foundational questions of life. So if you're taking notes, I want to answer four foundational questions today. And I'll go ahead and give them to you here at the start. First, who am I? Who are you? At the core, what is your identity? Then second, what is wrong in the world? All you have to do is open up your news feed on your phone to see things are not right in the world. Or for most of us, we can just look around in our lives and see things are not all right. So why is that? What is wrong in the world? And third, how can it be made right? Is there any hope that that which is wrong can be made right? Or is this just the way it is forever? Then finally, in light of the answers to these three questions, to ask how can I experience life to the full now and forever? which I assume we all want, right? Who of us doesn't want to experience life to the full now and forever? So how can we experience that? Now, obviously, that's a lot to cover in a little bit of time. So we really are just going to hit the highlights of these opening chapters of the Bible, hopefully in a way that we can all reset our lives at the start of this year. So first, who am I? Who are you? And from the first chapter of the Bible, after everything else in creation comes into being, we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Wow. What a picture of the dignity that marks you and me from the beginning of creation. Who am I? Who are you? According to the first chapter in the Bible, I am a man or a woman personally made by God in his image to enjoy and exalt him in all of his glory. So just think about this and how resetting this is in our world today. I'm a man or a woman. So God created each of us uniquely male or female. And his creation of our gender from the beginning was good. Obviously, God didn't have to create us this way. He could have created us gender neutral. But he created a beautiful distinction between man and woman, a distinction that is divinely designed, not humanly constructed. Contrary to ideas in our culture, gender identity is not chosen by people. It is given by God Amen. for our good, for our flourishing from the start of creation in unique and wonderful and beautiful and awesome ways with equal dignity. Both men and women created in God's own image. From the start of Scripture, God is speaking directly against any kind of male or female superiority or dominance, which means that in any culture, in any country, in any relationship, where man is thought to be better than woman, or woman is thought to be better than man, or where woman or man is treated as inferior, then we are going against the design of God. It is not right. It is never right to disparage or belittle women or men. Sexual inferiority or superiority, misogyny, male dominance, female exploitation, all of these things are sinful violations of God's word. And there is no place for them anywhere in the world or in our lives and relationships. I am a man or a woman personally made by God. So I'm borrowing here from language later in the Bible, Psalm 139 that describes how God knits us together in our mother's womb. 
But the focus here in Genesis chapter 1 is how, on how God personally creates us in this phrase, in his own image. And the language here is climactic after all of creation. Just think of God up to this point in Genesis 1 creating light and dark and earth and heavens and sky and waters and mountains and oceans and sun and moon and shining stars and fish and birds and fish and birds together. <laughs> Whether they want to be or not. <laughs> and small insects and large animals. Yet after all of that, at the pinnacle of creation, God made people, unlike everything else, in his image, which means we have the capacity to be in personal relationship with God. Apart from everything else in all creation, we have minds that are innately able to reason and remember and communicate in complex, abstract language. We have emotions that are deeply personal and intricately complex, ranging from love and compassion to grief and anger, sometimes all at once. We have moral intuition, a sense of right and wrong woven into the fabric of our being. And while we have intricately designed physical bodies, we are also spiritual beings, which as an important side note in our world today, sets us apart and will always set us apart from artificial intelligence and machines. No matter what, we can in our ingenuity manufacture physically with our most advanced technologies, we cannot make a spirit. And with all of these capacities, we're able to know and relate to God in a way that nothing else in this world can. And God made you for this reason so that you, right where you're sitting right now, might enjoy him in a personal relationship with him. You were made by God to enjoy God. In all of his glory, all of his attributes. And not just to enjoy him, but to exalt him in all of his glory. So for those of you who were here at Tyson's on Christmas Eve, I showed a video that night that I want to show to everyone this morning across all of our locations. I think it will be on the screen behind me. This video is a depiction by some German astronomers of zooming out from the earth. So just to give us a feel, so here we are on the earth, and as things zoom out, you start to get a picture of how small each of us are on a planet that recently surpassed 8 billion people. And as you keep zooming out, before long, what we think is a pretty big planet starts to come into perspective. In this world filled with mountains and oceans and continents and eight billion people, before long starts to look pretty small. And after a while, a relatively good while actually, you'll see the sun come into being, a modest star in our, in our galaxy, a mere 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. If we were just a fraction closer to it, we'd all burn up in an instant. Then even the sun disappears. And you start to see all these stars. A hundred billion stars. In our galaxy, they're everywhere. Which eventually leads to a glimpse of our entire galaxy, the Milky Way. And it hits you, wait a minute. 
Planet Earth isn't even at the center of our galaxy. We're just a dot on the side of our galaxy. And eventually our galaxy fades into the distance. And you'll start to see other lights. But these other lights that you see are not stars. Those lights are galaxies. So let's just pause the video at this point. Every single one of those lights is a galaxy. Each of those galaxies contains another hundred or billions or so stars. Scientists estimate there are about two trillion galaxies in what we call the observable universe and what we can even see. And the point I made on Christmas Eve is the same point I want to bring out this morning that maybe here in Metro Washington, D.C., we're not quite as big as we think we are. And maybe God is a lot greater than we think he is. Amen. And maybe the God who made this entire universe and every single one of us is worthy of more than some religious exercise, attending a service every once in a while, or maybe even every week, maybe this God is worthy of the worship of your entire life. Amen. Amen. Of all that you are, yes. all that you have. Yes. Maybe this is who you are, yes. a man or a woman personally made by God in his image to enjoy and exalt him in all of his glory. Yes. Do you realize what nobility you possess? Yes. Your identity, do not live down on yourself. When you look in the mirror in the morning, Behold the wonder of a man or a woman made in the image of God and made to enjoy him. Which then leads to our second question. After we ask, who am I? We inevitably ask, what is wrong in the world? And it takes a mere three chapters of the Bible to get an answer to that question. In Genesis chapter 2, Verse 16, we read that the beginning of creation, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of any, every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Enjoy the fruit of every tree in creation, except for one. And in the next chapter, Satan tempts Adam and Eve around that one. Genesis 3 says, he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you can't trust God. He's not good. God is keeping you from what's really good. And you know better than him what's best for you. So verse 6 tells us, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And from Genesis 3 on, Adam and Eve's story becomes your and my story. Every single one of us has believed the same lie. That we can't trust God. That we know better than God what is best for our lives. And this is what's wrong in the world. Every human, except one, who we'll talk about in a moment, 
has sinned against God, marring God's image in us and warranting God's judgment forever. Our stories are all different, yet in this sense, all the same. We have all believed that we know better than God what is best for our lives. We've all turned from God and his word to ourselves in our own ways, in our thoughts, our desires, our words, our actions. And as a result, the image of God in all of us has been marred. And just as clearly as God said to Adam and Eve, you will surely die, because of our sin, we will all surely die. And not just physically. Our sin separates us from God. And if we die in this state of separation from God, no matter how much good we've tried to do to overcome our sin, the reality is our sin still separates us from him. If we die in this state of separation from God, we will spend eternity in judgment, holy judgment due our sin. This is why this world is filled with evil and injustice, and war and pain, and sickness and suffering, because this world is filled with sin. And its effects are all around us. So, how can it be made right? Can it be made right? If so, how? And right here in Genesis 3, God makes a promise to Satan. He says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So follow this. God promised that one day one would come from the offspring specifically of woman. And Satan would bruise his heel. But this offspring would bruise, some translations say crush, Satan's head. Just ask the question, would you rather have your heel crushed or your head crushed? One hurts. The other delivers a fatal blow. And that is the point. God was promising one who would come from the offspring of woman who would crush sin, Satan, and death itself. Amen. And so we read Matthew 1, centuries after this promise was made in Genesis 3, God tells a man named Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her, her offspring, is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Amen. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. How can that which is wrong in the world be made right? God has made a way through Jesus for us to be saved from our sin and restored to relationship with him and for all creation to be completely redeemed. Amen. Jesus is God with us. God has come to us in this state. In this world, he has lived a life of no sin unlike anyone else in all of history. And then, even though he had no sin for which to die, he chose to die on a cross to pay the price for our sin. And then, three days after he died, Jesus rose from the grave in victory over sin and death. He crushed the serpent's head so that 
anyone who trusts in Jesus as Lord of their lives will be saved from their sin and restored to relationship with God. I ask every person within the sound of my voice right now, the question that determines life, have you put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sin and restore you to relationship with God? Have you trusted in the Lord of life to give you life? If not, I invite you to do that today. Today, right now, where you're sitting, you can be made right with God. Not through doing a certain number of things to try to overcome your sin. You can't do it. But through trusting in the one who has overcome sin and death for you. By trusting in Jesus, you can be forgiven of your sin, restored to relationship with God. And when you do, and for all who have trusted in Jesus, obviously there are still things wrong in this world and still things wrong in our lives, we are all still prone to sin. We all still experience suffering. And we will all still die. But we can know that because of faith in Jesus, sin will not have the last word in our lives. And suffering will not have the last word in our lives. Death itself will not have the last word in our lives. Jesus will have the last word in our lives. And one day, he is going to bring a full and final end to all the evil and all the injustice in the world. One day, he's going to take all that is wrong in the world, and he's going to make it right, completely redeemed. He's going to make it all new. So then how do we live now? In light of this, how can I experience life to the full now and forever? And the answer is clear, isn't it? I'll put it this way and then show it to you in God's word. By walking with God through praying, Fasting and hearing and obeying God's word. So I use this language specifically and intentionally based on what we see in the beginning of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament alike. This phrase, by walking with God. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, describes a man named Enoch. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. What a description of life. Taking a walk with God. Not just anybody. God. The one who made the universe. Walking with him. Same thing in Genesis 6, 9. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Life is found in walking with the one who made you and who loves you and who knows better than you what is best for your life. It's no surprise then to read Matthew chapter 4, hear Jesus' first words to his would-be disciples. Jesus, God with us, says, follow me. Walk with me. This is life. Walking with God through. And there are admittedly many things I could include here. But this is a summary based on what Jesus says in his very first sermon. Praying, fasting, and hearing and obeying God's word. So how do you walk with God? Here are the means by which you walk with God. Praying, Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room 
and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you see this promise of life? Go into your room, shut the door, and pray, spend time with God your Father. He's not distant from you. He's a Father to you. You're his child, and he wants you to experience reward. Every single day, reward is waiting for you in a room alone with you and God. I can think about that this morning. I was meeting with God this morning. Amen. <laughs> he was listening to me. The God who rules that whole universe, he was listening to me. Yes. And he was speaking to me. Yes. And comforting me and encouraging me. I was spending time with him. And it's not just me, it's anybody through Jesus. Yes. Anybody, anywhere. So find a room, close the door, and get alone and experience reward. Yes. Then a few verses later, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 17, and just like when you pray, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus says, periodically fast, set aside food, seek God, your Father, more than even food, and you will experience reward. Like he's better than a sandwich or a steak or vegetables if that's your preference. <laughs> He's better. And he closes this sermon with these words in Matthew 7, 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. You and I have a choice for how we can live this year. But none of us knows what this year holds, what rain or floods our winds are coming our way. But we do know this. We can either live standing on a rock or sinking in sand. So which do you choose? If you want to stand, then hear the words of Jesus and do them. If you want to sink, then hear the words of Jesus and don't do them. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If God is the author of life, the one who knows what is best for our lives, then of course we would listen to what he says and do it. So, I want to challenge you today to reset your life around walking with God through praying, fasting, and hearing and obeying God's word. And I want to remind you of acrostics that we use around here to help each other focus on these things. So pray. Like how are you going to set aside time every day to get alone with God and pray? Not because, let's be clear, you're trying to earn your way to God, earn your way to heaven, trying to gain some kind of credit with God. No, Jesus has already made the way to God, to heaven. When you trust in him, you're credited with his righteousness. We pray not because we're trying to get ourselves to God. We pray because we are in relationship with God. So we praise him for who he is and we thank him for what he's done and what he's doing in our lives. And we are repent 
On a daily basis, we examine our hearts and our minds and our lives and we confess our sin quickly, knowing that Jesus covers over our sins so we can live in close relationship with God. And we ask for specific needs in our lives and in others' lives. God has invited you to pour out your life, your heart to him, to ask him for things in your life, your family, and the lives of people around you and people around the world. At concentrated times during the day, then continually throughout the day. And as you do, to yield your life to him. God, lead my life however you want. I trust you're good, you're wise. You know what it's best. So lead my life to the full. So pray and fast. Just as you pray, also fast. Not like um, maybe for the really super spiritual fast. No, this is basic. When you fast, Jesus expects his followers to fast, to set aside time, to focus on God. Don't do this for others' approval in the world. Do this because you're seeking God above everything else in the world, including food. So you abstain from food. Decide not to eat for a meal or for a day or for multiple days, maybe a week or more. Instead of those times where you would normally eat, substitute that time with prayer and God's word. Say to God, more than I want breakfast or lunch or dinner, or all the above, I just want to be with you. You're better than everything in this world. Spend extra time praying, praising God, repenting of sin, asking for things, yielding your life to God and his direction for your life. Spend extra time meditating on and memorizing God's word. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in the process, taste and see that God is good. Discover in a fresh way that your soul is designed to be satisfied in God over and above everything in this world, even things like food that you definitely need. Discover that God's word is your most important daily bread. And truly live by every word that comes from his mouth. Which leads to the last acrostic, maps, that we use as a journey to discovering God's word, to hear and obey it. So meditate and memorize. Open the Bible, read a chapter or two, like in our Bible reading plan, and ask questions. What is this passage saying? What does it mean? To meditate means we don't just read the word, we read it slowly. We soak in what this passage is teaching us about who God is and who we are, who Jesus is, and what it means to follow him. And as we meditate, we look for verses or even passages or chapters to memorize. Memorization is one of the most practical ways of meditation. Because when you memorize something, you're saying it to yourself over and over and over again until it just becomes part of you. Here at Tyson's this morning in our worship gathering, Caroline, one of our students from The Rock, just quoted Psalm 25. It's a part of who she is. Amen. Praise God for students, for teenagers who are hiding God's word in their heart. God, help us to follow their example. So how will you memorize God's word? Maybe a verse a week, maybe more. Meditate and memorize and then apply. We don't just want to read the word. We saw that in Matthew 7. If we just hear the word, we'll sink in sand. We've got to do the word. So think head, heart, hands. How does what I just read in God's word affect the way I think? How does what I just read in God's word affect what I desire, what I want for my life, for my family, for the world around me? And hands, how does God's word, what I just read, affect the way I live, the way I speak, the way I act, the way I serve, the way I love, the way I work. And then we pray. We praise God according to his word. We repent 
according to his word, what we just read. We ask for things in our lives and for others' lives according to what we just read in God's word. And we yield to God's word. Everything we just talked about with prayer applied to God's word. And then we share. We write down reflections. I would encourage you to keep a journal. Whether you write it down with a pen or type it, just with reflections on God's word each day and how it applies to your life and prayers that flow from that. And then share with others what you're seeing in God's word, whether Christians or non-Christians alike. Encourage them with the word of life. So all of this leads to a practical step that I want to invite every person to take. Today, you can start even right now as I walk through this, or maybe later today, by the latest, by tomorrow morning in time alone with God. But we have designed an intentional way for each of us individually and all of us together to reset our lives here at the beginning of this year for the next 21 days specifically, so the next three weeks. So don't think just, okay, all of 2023. Just think, okay, for the next three weeks in my life, how am I going to walk with God? Can we just all do this? And again, you can go there right now or at some point today or tomorrow morning. Go to mclanebible.org slash 21 days. There's a place for you to put in your name and email. If you'd be willing, to say, hey, I'm in. We just want to send, the whole purpose of that is just to send encouraging emails over the next three weeks to you to spur you on. And then there are tons of resources all over this page. You can find our Bible reading plan there. You can find the link to the daily podcast that I do called Pray the Word. It goes along with our Bible reading plan. Just five minutes praying according to a verse in one of those chapters. You can find practical help for fasting. There's tons of resources there. And specifically, you'll see a 21 days of prayer checklist that's intended to help you think practically through a plan for these 21 days. There's encouragement to identify three things that you want to pray for, seek God for specifically over the next 21 days. And then there's a place to help you define, okay, where is my place? When is the time when I'm going to be alone with the Father in prayer and the Word? Each day. And then what, what's going to be my plan for fasting over the course of these 21 days? What would fasting look like? And there's encouragement to share whatever you're going to be doing with others in your church group or your family or your friends for mutual encouragement and mutual accountability. There's also information there about a late night prayer gathering we're going to have. I'm going to write this down so just you see it. January 20th. It's a Friday night from 8 to midnight. About midway through this journey, I want to encourage every member of this church and attenders, guests, you're more than welcome also, but especially every member, set aside this time, 8 to midnight, we're all going to be together from all our locations right here at Tyson's, seeking God together. This is the most important thing we do as a church family. Prioritize this. And big picture, let's, let's do this together. Over the next 21 days, let's reset around walking with God. Why? Because this is who you are. You are a man or a woman personally made by God to enjoy God. In a relationship with him. And though you and I have sin in our lives, Jesus has made a way for that sin to be covered, for us to be restored, for us to experience life to the full, walking with God. Why would we not step fully into that? And the process invite others to do that. Let's fast, let's pray, let's hear from, obey God's word. And in the promise, let's take God at his word and trust 
that there is a reward waiting for us when we do. So will you bow your heads with me? I want to give you a moment. Right now, just between you and God. If you bow your head, close your eyes. Like just between you and God in your seat right now. One, I would ask you first and foremost, do you have a relationship with God? Have you put your trust in Jesus to cover over your sin, to restore you to relationship with God? Do you know that if your next breath were to fail, where you would spend all of eternity? If the answer to that question is not a resounding, confident yes, then I invite you right now to say to God, just pray in your heart and say, God, I know I have sinned against you, but I believe that Jesus has died on a cross to pay the price for my sin. So today I ask you, forgive me of my sin, restore me to relationship with you. The Bible says by faith, you can be made right with God, not by your works, not by doing a bunch of stuff, by trusting in Jesus and his love for you. When you trust in Jesus, and for all who have, for all who know Jesus as Lord of your life, can we just pray, God, we want to walk with you. We want that to be the description of our lives. We walk with you. We praise you for the privilege for making this possible for us. Who are we to be in relationship with you, to walk with you? So God, we pray, take us deeper, draw us closer. I pray that over every single person within the sound of my voice who knows you. God, draw them closer to you, deep in their prayer life. Help them to discover your sufficiency through fasting in greater ways than they've ever experienced before. And help them, help us to hear and obey your word. God, we want to enjoy you to the full. Exalt you to the full. We want to experience the full reward that is found in you. So please bless, especially these next 21 days. Reset our lives. Don't let us get distracted, God. Help us to reset, refocus our lives on what matters forever. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of the one who makes all of this possible. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.